Number 10, bowling. Where would we be as a species if we didn't spend the entirety of the 1990s in bowling alleys and arcades? In later years, they seem to have fallen out of style, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why. Where else for $20 a person can you spend time in a large building with the heat on and the youngest people besides you and your friends is a league of retiree bowlers saying questionable things in the lane beside you. A blue carpet with planets and rocket ships has the same amount of character as the musky clown shoes you wear as you approach the snack stand. A waff of radioactive nacho cheese assaults your nose as the bubblegum chewing student behind the counter asks if you want another room temperature domestic beer. <laughs> nice. The foam and bacteria forming in your stomach is a classic tale of a bowling alley tucked away in a Midwest snow-covered state. <laughs> nice. Now, with my colorful depiction aside, let's get to the history. None of that glory would be possible without the Egyptians. Yes, they invented bowling. No nacho cheese and weird animations on the TV, but it was still bowling. The ball was made of rope and leather, or sometimes rock, as were the pins. Throw it at the pins. Simple. That's it. That's bowling. <laughs> Number nine, math. Oh, math. You remind me of a simpler time. A time when I was bawling my eyes out while my dad asked me over and over again, what is nine times three? Expecting me to come up with the answer under the enormous weight of patriarchal pressure. 27, dad, it's 27. While the ancient Greeks usually get credit for coming up with mathematics, they actually took it from the Egyptians across the Mediterranean. And then yes, they improved upon it. The Egyptians used a numeral system that helped them solve equations involving multiplication and the absolutely disgusting fractions. These guys understood concepts such as geometry and algebra, and they were the first civilization to develop and solve second degree quadratic equations. I don't even know what that means. I wonder if there was ever a little ancient Egyptian boy who got yelled at at the ancient dinner table by his ancient father about finding the circumference of a circle in the middle of the night. Probably. Number eight, papyrus. I heard Egyptians like paper. Well, you're gonna be doing a lot of paper rolling when you're living in a van down by the river. Huh, strange. I, I think I've heard that somewhere before. Yes, the Egyptians gave the world papyrus, which eventually would become paper. Writing stuff down before this was very difficult. It was inscribed in clay or stone tablets. That's hard. How is a stenographer supposed to do their job? Or when you get mad at an office printer for not working? You can't just break the tablet. We've all been there before, and if I were to make a list of the most important inventions of all time, paper would be on that list. Number seven, black ink. So you make papyrus paper, but what the heck are you gonna use to write on it? Ink, you're gonna use ink, obviously. That's right, the ancient Egyptians actually invented ink. Now, they weren't the only ones, the Chinese also invented ink around the same time as well. But this video ain't about them. The ink used by the Egyptians was made from soot and ash from burning wood or oil mixed with water. Some of their inks even contained lead that would help ancient Egyptians bind the ink to the paper. But they didn't just use black. They had red inks made from iron-based compounds as well as blue, green, white, and yellow. It was a colorful place and they were likely a colorful people. Number six, the haircut. A little off the top, Ramses. Honestly, it's time for me to get a haircut too. Is there any mommy out there willing to cut a blue-eyed boy's hair? I wish. I could go for some home cooking too. Anyway, I digress. Yes, the Egyptians very well may have invented the haircut or at least regular grooming practices. Having long hair just wasn't in their culture and honestly, in the hot sun and sands of Egypt, can you blame them? I don't think so. When I was younger, I used to have my head shaved. I thought it looked good. Eh, it kinda did, but the main reason I did it was because it kept me cool, it was functional. It may surprise you that yes, we got hot summers in Canada. So I can understand why the Egyptians did that. That being said, they did manage to keep some of their facial hair because beards are like makeup for men, we just look better with them, we look, we look good. It's a good look. Number five, the plow. Back in the day when we started to move away from the hunter-gatherer lifestyle to more of a work the land and make a new farm lifestyle, Omari would go out into the field with his hoe and cultivate his land by hand. As you can imagine, this takes a hell of a long time, but we're a problem-solving species. That's why we got to where we are now. And to the plow and the evolution of agriculture. So basically, you take your two favorite oxen and you connect them together and you connect them to a beam of wood that shoots out behind to the plow handle and to the blade of the plow that would go into the ground and be dragged behind by the ox, breaking up the ground. All the farmer has to do is sow the seed. This simple invention changed everything and it's still used in places where machinery is just unaffordable. Number four, the calendar. 
No one would blame you if in the last two years you forgot what day it was. I know after spending a lot of time inside, I forgot what day it was, but every day is a Saturday when you eat spicy chicken wings in your tidy whities well, the Egyptians may have had one of the first calendars and a gosh darn good one too. Their calendar had 12 months and over 300 days. The trouble is after a while it kind of got a little inaccurate. They did their best to fix it. I mean clearly if you look at the calendar, I mean clearly it's the it's the fifth of, uh, well I think that looks like three men walking in sand. And next month we have a special festival happening. It looks like it'll be a sunny day on the 12th of uh, man with ball on, on his hat. Uh, hieroglyphs are hard, man. I don't know. Number three, clocks. All right, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you the Egyptians invented the modern clock. No, but they did have to tell time. And as any dad or survival guru will tell you, the most reliable way to tell what time of the day it is would be that massive floating ball of plasma in the sky, the sun, assuming it isn't a super cloudy day or anything. The obelisks we see in Egypt were not just fancy deco pieces. They were actually sun clocks, used to see how the sun would cast shadows throughout different times of the day. They even used it to figure out which days were longer and shorter. There was an even more interesting clock though, a water clock. It was basically a stone vessel with a tiny little hole at the bottom which allowed water to drip at a constant rate. The water marks spaced out at different levels would tell you how many hours had passed. This one's good because it worked at night and on cloudy days as well. Number two, mummification. Welcome back to the land of the living, my friend. You've been gone for quite some time. <laughs> oh. Yes, the process of mummification, probably the number one thing ancient Egypt is known for, maybe besides the pyramids. While not the only civilization of the past to practice this, they kind of ran the show here. Basically, the pharaoh's corpse has to stay fresh so their soul can make it into the afterlife. The heart stays, but everything else is like a furniture after a bad divorce. It must go. The brain was stirred up like a family reunion square dance and drained like last night's punch bowl. But wait, horror fans, there's more. Lungs, liver, bladder, intestines, stomach, kidney, and basically anything you can scoop out with your favorite ice cream scoop is going. But don't toss them out though. Some of these organs were preserved in jars. Makes nice decorations beside the piles of gold found in the tombs. Yes, my liver jars. Oh, his. Number one, cosmetic makeup. The ancient Egyptians created makeup as far back as 4000 BC. That's a long time ago. And that's how long we've been obsessed with our looks. Yikes. Their makeup actually served more of a purpose than just looking good though. The eye makeup they used specifically was believed to cure eye diseases, which wasn't true, and would protect them from the evil eye, which, I don't know, could have been true. Kind of like the ink, they would use soot, but they would combine it with a lead mineral called galena to create a black substance they called coal. That's K-H-O-L, not C-O-A-L. They had multiple colors actually. They would make green makeup by combining malachite with galena. Now, if you saw our bizarre beauty products and history video, you probably know that lead, even lead minerals like galena, aren't really great for you. But hey, anything in the name of looking good. Kicking off the list at number 10, astronomy. You ever want to date somebody, but they're a Libra and you're a Gemini? Oh, ain't that the worst? Look, dating apps even have this now as a feature. You can write down what your symbol is, like, hi, I'm Kyle, I'm a Leo, and I love waking up early. Those are real bios for real people, and we have the Mayans to thank for all of this. The Maya studied the stars. They were the pioneers of our calendar, which I'll explain a little bit later on, but they also created lunar months. They figured that 81 lunar months added up to 2,392 days, meaning that one lunar month is 29.53 days, incredibly close to our modern moon month, which is crazy. They nailed it that long ago. They also studied Jupiter, Mars, and Mercury. They studied where each planet travels to and when. If you're a Libra, like me, smash that thumbs up. I'm a late Libra too. We're just trouble. We're the worst of the worst. Number nine, the Mayan calendar. It's 2022, which means the world thankfully did not end in 2012, but the Mayan calendar predicted that on December 21st, 2012, apparently it would be this massive doomsday. No, no meteors hit. That was all false. That wasn't a real thing. Thanos didn't snap any of us away. Nothing like that happened. But that day did mark the end of their 5,125 year long count calendar. Yeah, and you thought you were a planner, okay. The Mayan calendar is extremely accurate. Their calendar is 10 thousands of a day more exact than the calendar that the world uses today. They're that precise. We have leap years and stuff just to try and 
correct it. They used 20 day months and had two calendar years. They had a 260 day sacred round and then a 365 day year. Every 52 years, these two calendars would coincide with one another and this was referred to as a bundle. Imagine if we still had this now, that'd be so confusing. But 10, nine, eight, what are we saying? Seven. Number eight, chocolate. When I visited the UK, the, the first thing I noticed was how much better your chocolate was. So good. I'm not sure what y'all are doing over there. Maybe it's just made with love. Who knows? But I'm a huge chocolate guy and the UK nails it. Yeah, wash it down with some iron brew. Buddy, what a day, what a great day. The Mayans as well, turns out they loved chocolate. The old Mex of Mesoamerica figured out how to consume chocolate, but the Mayans made it beautiful. They added some spice to it, literally. The Mayans would mix chocolate with water, chili peppers, and honey. They would make a spicy drink. Are you into this idea? Is this making your lips happy right now? Spicy chocolate drinks? My tummy can barely handle a pumpkin spice latte, let alone a Mayan milkshake. No, thank you. Number seven. Math. One of the earliest uses of the number zero, being in mathematics, came from the Mayans. Thanks, awesome. They were super advanced in their mathematics, I would say for their time, but no, in general they were advanced. We're still trying to understand how they achieved what they did without calculators. It's impressive. They drew complex hieroglyphs on long strips of paper made from fig tree bark. They didn't have much to work with here, yet somehow it was still enough. The Maya numerical system only had three symbols. This was long before Bedmaz was born. They had zero, one, and five. That's it, you could literally count on one hand. There's a shell shape, a dab, and a bar. These numbers went from zero to 19, and then they would count groups of 20. By the time 36 BC rolled around, the Maya were introducing the concept of zero into their numbering system. Thanks guys, I failed math twice because of those zeros. Cheers. Number six, glyphs. Glyphs at number six, six glyphs. One of the most advanced forms of writing when it comes to all these ancient Americans, the Maya were the most ahead of their time. They invented the glyph, which are these symbols that represent a word or a sound. Like anything else in this civilization, it's beautiful to look at, of course. The Maya used around 700 different glyphs. They're detailed, they're beautiful. A good amount we're able to translate today, but there's still a mysterious chunk that we're trying to figure out. The earliest glyphs engravings go back to the third century BC, meaning that the Maya are the pioneers of writing in Mesoamerica. There are only a few civilizations where writing naturally occurred. The Mayans, ancient Chinese, and the ancient Mesopotamians. Number five, rubber. Rubber is a fundamental. I mean, sure, the long-term effects for rubber are questionable in turn. Now we have literal pits full of tires, but where did it all begin and why? The Maya created art, they looked to the stars and made calendars, but what did they do when they wanted to have a good time? Mayan meals were composed of maize, squash, and beans with tons of crops. Turns out the Maya were the ones who created elastic long before Mr. Goodyear over here. They made elastic from latex by mixing it with other plants. They really created bouncy balls, if anything. They took latex from trees and mixed it with vine juice. This was around 1600 BC, and you can't invent rubber balls without creating some. Number four. Ball games. Yeah, imagine inventing a bouncy ball. You can now create any game you want, any rules. You'll never lose again. How great is that? The Maya have pretty impressive ball courts. These games were all but fun, honestly. These were religious events. These games would last around 20 days on average, so I hope you warmed up that harm because you're gonna be here for a while. The pressure was always on also from the overlords as these courts were built at the bottom of a sanctuary. Yeah, hey, no pressure, but uh, your ex is here with Zeus. Break a leg. The go-to game was called pocket talk or hodgepodge, and you had to throw a heavy elastic ball through a hoop. Instead of fist bumping at the end of the day saying good game, good game, good game, the losing side would either one, not survive, dark, or they would have to give over all of their belongings, which also sucks. Yeah, a 20 day game, and then you'd lose all your stuff. That's horrible, what a horrible month. Number three, art. Of course we have to mention art. I'm not saying the Mayans invented art by any means. Each of these ancient civilizations had their own way of expressing the afterlife or life in general. Art was just everywhere. The Mayans specialized in decorating stone landmarks. There's only a handful of woodcut art pieces, but the most popular are these stone pieces from Copan and Carigua. They're extremely complex as well, obviously. Look at these. Rock climbers couldn't even get their fingers in these greaves, you know what I mean? Like, that's crazy, yet somehow people made them. These zoomorphs here are giant rock sculptures created in the shape of animals, which are always fun. And of course, the Mayans are also famous for their wall paintings dating back to 200 BC. One of the most well-preserved is at Bonampak. Look at this, this is incredible. We often look at Egyptians and their art, but this is incredible too, often overlooked. Number two, 
laws. The Maya made their own ball games, they made their own rules, they made chocolate their own way, but they also created law and order. In a time where food and shelter was sparse, you would think it would be a lot like the Dark Ages, just a bloody mess, you know, full of thieves and bodies and bad stuff everywhere. Well, when you're the first civilization to create the death penalty, everybody is pretty well behaved afterwards. More than fair, yeah, fair. Taking the life of another was uncommon because of these harsh laws. I mean, you remember how those ball games would end, right? Yeah, imagine crimes. If you were to take the life of another, say you lost a ball game, all your goods are now gone, you react in a horrible way, well, who comes knocking at your door asking questions? Who says you're now a suspect? Sherlock Holmes? No. Say you live with somebody and they commit a crime. Well, not only are they now gone after they get caught, but the victim also gets your land. They get all your goods, cattle, your home, everything. So whoever lives with you as well, well, you better pack your rubber balls. You're out of here. You don't live here anymore, thanks to Good Game Gordo over here. I'm glad certain things stuck around, like the law and order part, but uh, imagine being evicted because your roommate stole some beans. God damn it, Craig. Don't do that. And finally, number one, the underworld. Also referred to as the place of fright. Okay, save the best for last, we love it. Zibalba comes from Mayan mythology. Overseen, of course, by the Mayan death gods, Zibalba came to be in the 16th century Verapaz. The entrance to such a wonderful place was in the cave of Guatemala. So, splunkers beware if you were putting that on your agenda. Maybe avoid this one. Caves in Belize are actually known as the entrance to Zibalba, these water-filled caves again, and they span as far as 300 feet. That's a massive, evil front door you wanna avoid right there. But you can't just grab a snorkel and frog kick your way to the underworld, it's not that easy. According to ancient Maya scripture, the Popol Vuh, this path once filled with dark obstacles, and when I say dark obstacles, I mean dark. I'm talking a river filled with scorpions and blood combined with houses littered with bats and pure darkness. It's not easy to get through. It's like those haunted houses in Niagara Falls. It's really scary. This is why you don't cheat in Mayan ball games. You end up here. Do you wanna be here? No. In fact, if you cheat in Monopoly, I believe you also end up here. Yeah, I'm talking to you, Stacy. Don't cheat. Number 10, Greek fire. You know what's scary? Fire. You know what's even scarier than that? Someone who can shoot streams of fire at you. While some people love the smell of napalm in the morning, they are usually the people doing the firing. And it wasn't just shirtless Americans who did the firing, no. Somehow, the ancient Greeks also used a proto-napalm that would be used against other ships in naval warfare. The substance would apparently cling to flesh and was impossible to extinguish with water. What puzzles us is that the recipe for Greek fire was never told to anyone. It was a secret on the same level as the Krabby Patty secret formula. People have experimented with different ingredients that the Byzantine Empire had access to. The Mythbusters, my favorite scientists, used naphtha, which is made from a light crude oil, mixed with pine resin, and they burned down a ship in a few seconds. I'm sure at the time, people thought that those who used Greek fire were wielding the power of a god or something. Number nine, Damascus steel. While off on the Crusades, a lot of Europeans came into contact with things they'd never seen before. Spices, for example. Please cut it with the bland food, guys, please. Another thing they saw were warriors who wielded blades that could slice through floating handkerchiefs, but also bend to ridiculous degrees without breaking. These blades were made from what was called Damascus steel. But for some reason, we actually have no idea what these blades were actually made of, or what the process for making it could even be. Some people think it could have been made by mixing iron with plant matter, which could have given the kind of flexibility I'll never have. But we don't know what plant matter, and we don't even know for sure that's how it was done. Best guess is that it was made of crucible steel, which, <laughs> can I just say, sounds really cool. But that's just a theory. Uh, wait, that's the wrong channel. Number eight, the Voynich Manuscript. This may be a little bit insensitive of me, but the drawings in the Voynich Manuscript kind of look like the same things I used to doodle in my notebooks when I stopped paying attention in class. I definitely never wrote like that, though. The Voynich Manuscript is named after Wilfred Voynich, who was a Polish collector and bookseller in 1912 when he acquired the manuscript. It's from around the 15th century and is written in this really cool looking code with strange drawings. The font actually kind of reminds me of the font from Lord of the Rings. Does anyone else see that or am I, am I weird? A lot of the pictures drawn in the book seem to be plants, but then you get the random page that has a string of what looks like pregnant women and you're back to square one. I don't know, but I'm still going with somebody's encrypted notebook with fun doodles for when they're bored. Number seven, Ulfbort swords. How do you make a sword that your society did not have the technology for? 
That is an excellent question, and it is the question that Viking Ulfbert swords pose to historians. The problem with Ulfbert swords is that the technology required for making them did not appear until about 800 years later. Now the thing that kind of bothers me with that assumption is we are assuming that it didn't appear until 800 years later because we haven't found evidence to prove otherwise, except for the swords themselves. In Viking society, a lot of stuff was made with wood and other degradable things, which makes it really hard to know too much about the ancient peoples. What's really interesting is how a Viking sword bearing an Arabic inscription was found. Perhaps these swords were made with Damascus steel. The recipe for which was given to the Vikings through trade, maybe? We need more evidence to know for sure. Number six, Baghdad battery. Do you know how a battery works? Allow me to explain. I don't really know. Um, what I do know is that it involves chemistry. Google tells me the chemical reactions in a battery involve the flow of electrons from one material to another through an external circuit. I don't know. We often think of batteries as a moderately modern invention. And for the most part, that's true. But then there's the Baghdad battery. The Baghdad battery, or batteries because there are a bunch of them, were discovered outside modern day Baghdad in Iraq in 1936. And it's basically a clay pot with a copper cylinder inside of it. Inside the copper cylinder was an iron rod held in place with asphalt. Now, if you take an electrolyte liquid like like even grape juice or something, and put it in the pot, the pots now become batteries, generating about two volts of electricity. The crazy thing about this is that they were found in a Paleolithic village, which is like the Stone Age. We have absolutely no idea what the electricity was used for, but probably because it's fun to administer minor electrical shocks to yourself, right? Number five, Iron Pillar. The Iron Pillar of Delhi is well, it's pretty self-explanatory actually. It's, it's an iron pillar, which is more than 1600 years old. I leave my bike out in the rain for like three days and it's a rusty pile of junk. But this thing has been out in the open for all those years and it never gained a single speck of rust. How the heck is that possible? I don't know. None of us actually know. Some people think it might have to do with the climate in Delhi, as if it was just in the perfect spot to not rust. But then others think it has to do with the phosphorus and absence of sulfur and manganese in the iron, plus its size. I don't know, my pea-sized brain won't be able to tell you the answer, but it certainly is a puzzling one. Number four, Chinese seismoscope. At first glance, I can confidently say that I would not assume this was the seismoscope. It was basically a big old pot with a bunch of dragons around the outside that would symbolize each direction on a compass. And when an earthquake would happen, the dragon that represented the direction the quake came from would spit out a ball into a bronze toad's mouth. Now, apart from bronze dragons spitting balls into bronze frog mouths, this is an extremely sophisticated device. And absolutely no one knows how it works. We have guesses about what could do it, but this thing can detect the direction of earthquakes 400 miles away. That's insane. And they still made it into a work of art. I am impressed. Good show, good show. Number three, Antikythera mechanism. I kinda hate when people think complex things in history had to be because of aliens. Just because these people were ancient does not mean that they were stupid. They just didn't have the vast amounts of shared knowledge we have now. Then you show me the Antikythera mechanism and all I can think is aliens. This thing was probably built around the second century BC and it had the capability of calculating and displaying things like the phases of the moon and the lunisolar calendar, which is just crazy. We know that people did study that and gear based tech like this had actually been a thing for a long, long time before. We think of computers as modern things, but there were machines capable of doing calculations before electricity and computer chips. Some of us have to start giving these ancient civilizations more credit instead of just jumping to aliens or to time travel. Number two, Roman dodecahedron. 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 Oh, what? Oh yeah, sorry, I got a video to make. Uh, here, look at this thing. This is a Roman dodecahedron. And guess what? We have absolutely no idea what it's supposed to do. But we do know that Europe has tons of these, and they all date back to the Roman era. 
Like all dodecahedra, it has 12 sides, and each side has a differently sized hole. They also have strange bulbs on each corner. They would range in sizes too, being anywhere from 4 to 11 centimeters. I'm honestly stumped about what it could be. People have theorized they could be uh, paperweights, toys, candle holders, dice, or even a thing used to measure finger sizes for rings. Let me know what you think it could be. Number 1. Easter Island If you thought this point was going to be about the huge statues on the island, well think again. While those statues are a mystery all on their own, this point is actually going to be about Rongo Rongo. What the heck is Rongo Rongo? Well, Rongo Rongo is possibly a form of ancient writing. What makes it stand apart is that it is almost nothing like any other form of writing from any other culture in the world, at least that we know of. Look at this really handy dandy rock that's covered in the writing. Can you make anything out of it? Apparently, the symbols are based on Polynesian religious motifs. My brain is just a, a smidge too slow to get any kind of information out of it. It just makes me really wish I had a secret language, you know? 